A year ago, Paul O'Neill was fired from his job as George Bush's Treasury Secretary for disagreeing too many times with the president's policy on tax cuts. Tonight, O'Neill, who is known for speaking his mind, talks for the first time about his two years inside the Bush administration. His story is the centerpiece of a new book being published this week about the way the Bush White House is run. Entitled The Price of Loyalty, the book, by a former Wall Street Journal reporter, draws on interviews with high-level officials who gave the author their personal accounts of meetings with the president, their notes and documents. But the main source of the book was Paul O'Neill. Paul O'Neill says he's going public because he thinks the Bush administration has been too secretive about how decisions have been made. Contrary to how we practice politics today in this country, there is some market for the truth. Yeah. You interviewed how many other people? Oh, hundreds of people. Hundreds? Hundreds of people. How many other cabinet members? Um, several. Let's just say several. So we're but O'Neill is the only one who spoke on the record. Didn't someone in this administration, high up, yeah. call him on the phone and warn him not to do this book? Yes, yes. And well, who was it? Don Rumsfeld. And what happened at President Bush's very first National Security Council meeting is one of O'Neill's most startling revelations. In the very beginning, there was a conviction uh, that Saddam Hussein was a bad person and that he needed to go. He says that going after Saddam Hussein was topic A 10 days after the inauguration, eight months before September 11th. From the very first instance, it was about Iraq, it was about what we can do uh, to change this regime. Now, everybody else thought that grew out of 9-11. No. But this book says it was day one of this administration. Day one, these things were laid uh, and sealed. As Treasury Secretary, O'Neill was a permanent member of the National Security Council. He says in the book he was surprised at the meeting that questions such as why Saddam and why now were never asked. It's all about finding a way to do it. That was the tone of it. The president saying, go find me a way to do this. For me, uh, the notion of, of preemption, that the U.S. has the unilateral right uh, to do whatever we decide to do, is a, is a really huge leap. And that and came up on, uh, at this first meeting. It did. O'Neill told us the discussion of Iraq continued at the next National Security Council meeting two days later. He got briefing materials under this cover sheet. There are memos. One of them, marked secret, says a uh, plan for post-Saddam Iraq. Nation building. Absolutely. So they discussed an occupation of Iraq. In January and February of, the, of 2001. Based on his interviews with O'Neill and several other officials at the meetings, Suskind writes that the planning envisioned peacekeeping troops, war crimes tribunals, and even divvying up Iraq's oil wealth. Suskind obtained this Pentagon document, dated March 5, 2001, entitled Foreign Suitors for Iraqi Oil Field Contracts. It includes a map of potential areas for exploration. It talks about um, contractors uh, uh, around the world from, you know, 30, 40 countries and which ones have what intentions or... On oil. On oil in Iraq. During the campaign, candidate Bush had criticized the Clinton-Gore administration for being Nation too Europe. interventionist. We, if we don't stop extending our troops all around the world uh, in nation-building missions, then we're going to have a serious problem coming down the road and I, I'm going to prevent that. The president had just run a campaign about being humble and not engaging in, in nation-building. The thing that's most surprising, I think, is how emphatically, from the very first, this administration had said X during the campaign, but from the first day was often doing Y, not just saying Y, but actively moving toward the opposite of what they had said during the election. 